Chapter Eight of Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen, by Catherine Owen. Chapter Eight: Roasting. In spite of Briat Savarin's maxim that one may become a cook but must be born a rotisseur i am inclined to think one may also by remembering one or two things become a very good roaster to translate the untranslatable especially in our day when the oven has taken the place of the spit although a great deal of meat is spoiled in roasting a loin of lamb or piece of beef that comes to the table so pale that you can't tell whether it has been boiled or merely wilted in the oven is an aggravation so familiar that a rich brown well roasted joint is generally a surprise perhaps the cook will tell you she has had the hottest kind of an oven but then she has probably also had a well of water beneath it the vapour from which arising all the time has effectually soddened the meat and checked the browning the surface of roast meat should be covered with a rich glaze scientifically called osmazone that the meat may be thus glazed it should always go into a hot oven so that as the gravy exudes it may congeal on the outside thus sealing up the pores the general plan however is to put meat into a warm oven an hour or two earlier than it should go with a quantity of water and flour beneath it the result in hot weather i have known to be very disagreeable the tepid oven having in fact given a stale taste to the joint before it began to cook and it at all times results in flavorless tough meat there is no time saved either in putting the meat in while the oven is yet cool heat up the oven till it is quite brisk then put the meat in a pan in which if it is fat you require no water if very lean you may put half a teacup just enough to prevent the pan burning you may rub a little flour over the joint or not as you please but never more than the surface moisture absorbs have no clinging particles of flour upon the joint neither put salt nor pepper upon the meat before it goes into the oven salt draws out the gravy which it is your object to keep in and the flavor of pepper is entirely changed by the parching it undergoes when on the surface of the meat the odor of scorched pepper while cooking being very offensive to refined nostrils this does not occur when pepper is not on the surface for the inside of birds in stuffing and in meat pies it is indispensable and the flavor undergoes no change this remark on pepper applies also to broiling and frying always pepper after the article is cooked and both for appearance and delicacy of flavor white pepper should always be used in preference to black meat while in the oven should be carefully turned about so that it may brown equally and when it has been in half the time you intend to give it or when the upper surface is well browned turn it over when it comes out of the oven put it on a hot dish then carefully pour off the fat by holding the corner of the meat pan over your dripping pan and very gently allowing the fat to run off do not shake it when you see the thick brown sediment beginning to run too check it if there is still much fat on the surface take it off with a spoon then pour into the pan a little boiling water and salt in quantity according to the quantity of sediment or glaze in the pan and with a spoon rub off every speck of the dried gravy on the bottom and sides of the pan add no flour the gravy must be thick enough with its own richness if you have added too much water so that it looks poor you may always boil it down by setting the pan on the stove for a few minutes but it is better to put very little water at first and add as the richness of the gravy allows now you have a rich brown gravy instead of the thick whitey brown broth so often served with roast meat every drop of this gravy and that from the dish should be carefully saved if left over save all dripping except from mutton or meat with which onions are cooked for purposes which i shall indicate in another place veal and pork require to be very thoroughly cooked for them therefore the oven must not be too hot 
neither must it be lukewarm a good even heat is best if likely to get too brown before it is thoroughly cooked open the oven door end of chapter eight chapter nine of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter nine boiling boiling is one of the things about which cooks are most careless theoretically they almost always know meat should be slowly boiled but their idea of slow is ruled by the fire they never attempt to rule that there is a good rule given by gouffet as to what slow boiling actually is the surface of the pot should only show signs of ebullition at one side just an occasional bubble simmering is a still slower process and in this the pot should have only a sizzling sound one part of the edge all fresh meat should boil slowly ham or corned beef should barely simmer yet they must not go off the boil at all which would spoil fresh meat entirely steeping in water gives a flat insipid taste all vegetables except potatoes asparagus peas and cauliflower should boil as fast as possible these four only moderately most vegetables are boiled far too long cabbage is as delicate as cauliflower in the summer and fall if boiled in plenty of water to which a salt spoonful of soda has been added as fast as possible for twenty minutes or half an hour then drained and dressed in winter it should be cut in six or eight pieces boiled fast in plenty of water for half an hour no longer always give it plenty of room let the water boil rapidly when you put it in the pot which set on the hottest part of the fire to come to that point again and you will have no more strong rank yellow stuff on your table no bad odor in your house peas require no more than twenty minutes boiling if young asparagus the same the latter should always be boiled in a saucepan deep enough to let it stand up in the water when tied up in bunches for this saves the heads potatoes should be poured off the minute they are done and allowed to stand at the back of the stove with a clean cloth folded over them they are the only vegetable that should be put into cold water when new boiling water is proper when quite ripe they are more floury if put in cold water soups as i have before said i do not pretend to give many recipes only to tell you how to succeed with the recipes given in other books i shall therefore only give one recipe which i know is a novelty and one for the foundation of all soups in one sense i have done the latter already the stock for glaze is an excellent soup before it is reduced but i will also give jules gouffet's method of making pot au feu it being a most beautifully clear soup it often happens however that you have sufficient stock from bones trimmings of meat and odds and ends of gravies which may always be turned to account but the stock from such a source although excellent will not always be clear therefore you must proceed with it in the following manner unless you wish to use it for thick soup make your stock boiling hot and skim well then have ready the whites of three eggs i am supposing you have three quarts of stock one egg to a quart to which add half a pint of cold water whisk well together then add half a pint of the boiling stock gradually still whisking the eggs then stir the boiling stock rapidly pouring in the whites of eggs etc as you do it stir quickly till nearly boiling again then take it from the fire let it remain till the whites of eggs separate then strain through a clean fine cloth into a basin this rule once learned will clear every kind of soup or jelly there are many people who are good cooks yet fail in clear soup which is with them semi-opaque while it should be like sherry the cause of this opacity is generally quick boiling while the meat is in this gives it a milky appearance after the stock is once made and clear quick boiling will do no harm but of course waste the soup unless resorted to for the purpose of making it stronger a word here about coloring soup most persons resort to burnt sugar 
and very carefully used it is not at all a bad makeshift but how often have we a rich-looking soup put before us the vermicelli appearing to repose under a lake of strong russet bouillon but which on tasting we find suggestive of nothing but burnt sugar and salt every bit of flavor destroyed by the acrid coloring sometimes stock made by the recipe for pot au feu to follow requires no color this depends on the beef but usually all soup is more appetizing in appearance for a little browning and for this purpose i always use burnt onions in preference to anything else if you have none in store when the soup is put on put a small onion in the oven or on the back of the stove should you be baking anything the odor would taint turn it off until it gets quite black but not charred then put it to the soup it adds a fine flavor as well as color and you need not fear overdoing it soup that is to be reduced must be very lightly salted for this reason salt is left out altogether for glaze as the reduction causes the water only to evaporate the salt remains gouffet's pot au feu four pounds of lean beef six quarts of water six ounces of carrot six of turnip six of onion half an ounce of celery one clove salt put the meat on in cold water and just before it comes to the boil skim it and throw in a wine glass of cold water skim again and when it is on the boil again throw in another wine glass of cold water do this two or three times the object of adding the cold water is to keep it just off the boil until all the scum has risen as the boiling point is when it comes to the surface yet once having boiled the scum is broken up and the soup is never so clear the meat must simmer slowly not boil for three hours before the vegetables are added then for a couple of hours more it is necessary to be very exact in the proportions of vegetables but of course after having weighed them for soups once or twice you will get to know about the size of a carrot turnip etc that will weigh six ounces the exact weight is given until the eye is accustomed to it this soup strained and boiled down to one half becomes consomme celery cream is a most delicious and little known white soup and all lovers of good things will thank me for introducing it have some nice veal stock or the water in which chickens have been boiled reduced till it is rich enough will do or some very rich mutton broth but either of the former are preferable then put on a half cup of rice in a pint of rich milk and grate into it the white part and root of two heads of celery let the rice milk cook very slowly at the back of the stove adding more milk before it gets at all stiff when tender enough to mash through a coarse sieve or fine colander add it to the stock which must have been strained and be quite free from sediment season with salt and a little white pepper or cayenne boil all together gently a few minutes it should look like rich cream and be strongly flavored with celery of course the quantity of rice milk and celery must depend on the quantity of stock you have i have given the proportion for one quart which with the milk etc added would make about three pints of soup End of chapter 9chapter ten of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter ten sauces Talleyrand said England was a country with twenty-four religions and only one sauce. He might have said two sauces, and he would have been literally right as regards both England and America. Everything is served with brown sauce or white sauce, and how often the white sauce is like bookbinder's paste, brown, a bitter, tasteless brown mess. Strictly speaking, perhaps, the French have but two sauces either, espagnole, or brown sauce, and white sauce, which they call the mother sauces, 
But what changes they ring on these mother sauces? The Espanol once made, with no two meats is it served alike in flavor, and in this matter of flavor the artist appears. In making brown sauce for any purpose, bethink yourself of anything there may be in your storeroom, with which to vary its flavor, taking care that it shall agree with the meat for which it is intended. The ordinary cook flies at once to Worcestershire or Harvey sauce, which are excellent at times, but toujours pour de is not always welcome. A pinch of mushroom powder or a few chopped oysters are excellent with beef or veal. So will be a spoonful of Montpellier butter stirred in or curry, not enough to yellow the sauce, but enough to give a dash of piquancy. A pickled walnut chopped or a gherkin or two go admirably with mutton or pork chops. In short, this is just where imagination and brains will tell in cooking, and little essays of invention may be tried with profit. But beware of trying too much. Make yourself perfect in one thing before venturing on another. A spaniel, or brown sauce, is simply a rich stock, well flavored with vegetables and herbs, and thickened with a piece of roux, or with brown flour. White sauce is one of those things we rarely find perfectly made. Bad it is the ne plus ultra of badness. Good it is delicious. Those who have tried to have it good and failed, I beg to try the following method of making it. Take an ounce and a half of butter and a scant tablespoon of flour. Mix both with a spoon into a paste. When smooth, add half a pint of warm milk a small teaspoonful of salt, and the sixth part of one of white pepper. Set it on the fire till it boils, and is thick enough to mask the back of the spoon transparently, and then add a squeeze of lemon juice, and another ounce and a half of fresh butter. Stir this till quite blended. This sauce is the foundation for many others and for some purposes the beaten yolk of an egg is introduced when just off the boil capers may be added to it or chopped mushrooms or chopped celery or oysters according to the use for which it is intended the object of adding the second butter is because boiling takes away the flavor of butter by stirring half of it in without boiling you retain it end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen, by Catherine Owen. Chapter 11 Warming Over. Hash is a peculiarly american institution in no other country is every remnant of cold meat turned into that one unvarying dish what do i say remnants of cold meat rather joints of cold meat a roast of beef of which the tenderloin had sufficed for the first day's dinner the leg of mutton from which a few slices only have been taken the fillet of veal available for so many delicate dishes all are ruthlessly turned into the all-pervading hash the curious thing is that people are not fond of it men exclaim against it and its name stinks in the nostrils of those unhappy ones whose home is the boarding-house yet hash in itself is not a bad dish when i say it is a peculiarly american institution i mean that when english people speak of hash they mean something quite different meat warmed in slices our hash in its best form that is made with nice gravy garnished with sippets of toast and pickles surrounded with mashed potatoes or rice is dignified abroad by the name of mince and makes its appearance as an elegant little entree nor would it be anathematized in the way it is with us if it were only occasionally introduced it is the familiarity that has led to contempt 
but what shall i do asked the young wife distressfully john likes joints and he and i and bridget can't possibly eat a roast at a meal very true and it is to just such perplexed young housekeepers that i hope this chapter will be especially useful that is to say small families with moderate means and a taste for good things in this as in many other ways large families are easier to cater for they can consume the better part of a roast at a meal and the remains it is no great harm to turn into hash although even they might with little trouble and expense have agreeable variety introduced into their bill of fare in england and america there is great prejudice against warmed-over food but on the continent one eats it half the time in some of the most delicious made dishes without suspecting it herein lies the secret with us and our transatlantic cousins the warming over is so artlessly done that the hard fact too often stares at us from out the watery expanse in which it reposes one great reason of the failure to make warmed over meat satisfactory is the lack of gravy on the goodness of this as well as its presence depends the success of your rechauffe the glaze for which i have given the recipe renders you at all times independent in this respect but at the same time it should not alone be depended on every drop of what remains in the dish from the roast should be saved and great care be taken of all scraps bones and gristle which should be carefully boiled down to save the necessity of flying to the glaze for every purpose i will here give several recipes which i think may be new to many readers salmi of cold meat is exceedingly good melt butter in a saucepan if for quite a small dish two ounces will be sufficient when melted stir in a little flour to thicken let it brown but not burn or if you are preparing the dish in haste put in some brown flour then add a glass of white or red wine and a cup of broth or a cup of water and a slice of glaze a sprig or two of thyme parsley a small onion chopped and one bay leaf pepper and salt simmer all thoroughly all savory dishes to which wine is added should simmer long enough for the distinct winey flavor to disappear only the strength and richness remaining strain this when simmered half an hour and lay in the cold meat squeeze in a little lemon juice and draw the stew pan to the back of the stove but where it will cook no longer or the meat will harden serve on toast and pour the sauce over a glass of brandy added to this dish when the meat goes in is a great addition if an extra fine salmi is desired by not allowing the flour and butter to brown and using white sauce this is a very fine sauce in which to warm cold chicken veal or any white meat boeuf a la jardiniere put in a fireproof dish if you have it or a thick saucepan a pint of beef broth a small bunch each of parsley chervil tarragon very little of this shallot or onion capers pickled gherkins of each or any a teaspoonful chopped fine roll a large tablespoonful of butter with a dessert spoonful of brown flour stir it in then take slices of underdone beef with a blunt knife hack each slice all over in fine dice but not to separate or cut up the slices then pepper and salt each one and lay it in with the herbs sprinkle a layer of herbs over the beef and cover closely then stand the dish in the oven to slowly cook for an hour or if you use a stew pan set in a pan of boiling water on the stove for an hour where the water will just boil serve on a dish surrounded with young carrots and turnips if in season or old ones cut beef au gratin cut a little fat bacon or pork very thin sprinkle on it chopped parsley onion and mushrooms mushroom powder will do and bread crumbs then put in layers of beef cut thick and well and closely hacked then another layer of bacon or pork cut thin as a wafer and of seasoning crumbs last pour over enough broth or gravy to moisten well in which a little brandy or wine may be added if an especially good dish is desired 
bake slowly an hour pseudo beefsteak cut cold boiled or roast beef in thick slices broil slowly lay in a hot dish in which you have a large spoonful of montpellier butter melted sprinkle a little mushroom powder if you desire and garnish with fried potato cutlets a la jardiniere trim some thick cutlets from a cold leg of mutton or chops from the loin dip them in frying batter a la carême fry crisp and quickly and serve wreathed round green peas or a ragout made as follows take young carrots turnips green peas white beans stew gently in a little water to which the bones of the meat and trimmings have been added and which must be carefully removed not to disfigure the vegetables encircle this ragout with the fried cutlets and crown with a cauliflower cromesqui of lamb is a polish recipe cut some underdone lamb mutton will of course do quite small also some mushrooms cut small or the powder put in a saucepan a piece of glaze the size of a pigeon's egg with a little water or broth warm it and thicken with yolks of two eggs just as you would make boiled custard that is without letting it come to the boil or it will curdle then add the mushrooms and meat let all get cold and divide it into small pieces roll in bread crumbs sifted then in egg then in crumbs again and fry in very hot fat or you may after rolling in bread crumbs lay each piece in a spoon and dip it into frying batter let the extra batter run off and drop the chromesqui into the hot fat these will be good made of beef and rolled up in a bard of fat pork cut thin and fried serve with sauce piquant made thus take some chopped parsley onion and pickled cucumbers simmer till tender and thicken with an equal quantity of butter and flour of course your own brightness will tell you that if you are in haste a spoonful of montpellier butter the same of flour melted in a little water to which you add a teaspoonful of vinegar will make an excellent sauce piquant and this same is excellent for anything fried as breaded chops croquettes etc i may here say that where two or three herbs are mentioned as necessary for instance parsley tarragon and chervil if you have no tarragon you must leave it out or chervil the same it is only a matter of flavoring at the same time flavor is a great deal and these french herbs give that indescribable cachet to a dish which is one of the secrets of french cooking therefore if you are a wise matron you will have a supply on hand even if only bought dry from the druggist miraton of beef peel and cut into thin slices two large onions put them in a stew pan with two ounces of butter place it over a slow fire stir the onions round till they are rather brown but not in the least burnt add a teaspoonful of brown flour mix smoothly then moisten with half a pint of broth or water with a little piece of glaze three saltspoonfuls of salt unless your broth was salted then half the quantity or less two of sugar and one of pepper put in the cold beef cut in thin slices as lean as possible let it remain five minutes at the back of the stove then serve on a very hot dish garnished with fried potatoes or sippets of toast to vary the flavor sometimes put a spoonful of tarragon or plain vinegar or a teaspoonful of mushroom powder or a pinch of curry unless objected to or a few sweet herbs in fact as you may see variety is as easy to produce as it is rare to meet with in average cooking and depends more on intelligence and thoughtfulness than on anything else the simplest of all ways of warming a joint that is not far cut is to wrap it in thickly buttered paper and put it in the oven again contriving if possible to cover it closely let it remain long enough to get hot through not to cook by keeping it closely covered it will get hot through in less time and the steam will prevent it getting hard and dry make some gravy hot and serve with the meat if your gravy is good and plentiful your meat will be as nice as the first day without gravy it would be an unsatisfactory dish if you cannot manage to cover the joint in the oven you may put it in a pot 
over the fire without water but with a dessert spoonful of vinegar to create steam let it get hot through and serve as before for the third day the meat may be warmed up in any of the ways i am going to mention repeating once more that you must have gravy of some kind or else carefully make some with cracked bones gristle etc stewed long and nicely flavored with any kind of sauce ragout a very nice ragout may be made from cold meat thus slice the meat put it in a stew pan in which an onion or several if you like them has been sliced squeeze half a lemon into it or a dessert spoonful of vinegar cover closely without water and when it begins to cook set the stew pan at the back of the stove for three quarters of an hour shaking it occasionally the onion should now be brown take out the meat dredge in a little flour stir it round and add a cup of gravy pepper salt and a small quantity of any sauce or flavoring you prefer stew gently a minute or two then put the meat back to get hot and serve garnish with sippets of toast or pickles a nice little breakfast dish is made thus cut two long slices of cold meat and three of bread buttered thickly about the same shape and size season the meat with pepper salt and a little finely chopped parsley or if it is veal a little chopped ham then lay one slice of bread between two of meat and have the other two slices outside fasten together with short wooden skewers if you have a quick oven put it in and take care to baste with butter thoroughly that the bread may be all over crisp and brown if you can't depend on your oven fry it in very hot fat as you would crullers garnish with sprigs of parsley and serve very hot to warm a good size piece of beef trim it as much like a thick fillet as you can cut it horizontally halfway through then scoop out as much as you can of the meat from the inside of each piece chop the meat fine that you have thus scooped out season with a little finely chopped parsley and thyme a shred of onion if you like it or if you have celery boil a little of the coarser part till tender chop it and add as much bread finely crumbled as you have meat and a good piece of butter add pepper and salt and make all into a paste with an egg mixed with an equal quantity of gravy or milk fill up the hollow in the meat and tie or still better sew it together you may either put this in a pot with a slice of pork or bacon and a cup of gravy or you may brush it over with beaten egg cover it with crumbs and pour over these a cup of butter melted so that it moistens every part and bake it taking care to baste well while baking serve with nice gravy beef olives are no novelty to the ear but it is a novel thing to find them satisfactory to the palate take some stale bread crumbs an equal quantity of beef finely chopped some parsley and thyme a little scraped ham if you have it a few chives or a slice of onion all chopped small as possible put some butter in a pan and let this force meat just simmer not fry in it for ten minutes while this is cooking cut some underdone oblong slices of beef about half an inch thick hack it with a sharp knife on both sides then mix the cooked force meat with the yolk of an egg and a tablespoonful of gravy put a spoonful of this paste in the centre of each slice of meat and tie it up carefully in the shape of an egg then if you have some nice gravy thicken it with a piece of butter rolled in flour roll each olive slightly in flour and lay it in the gravy and let it very gently simmer for half an hour a few chopped oysters added to the gravy will be a great addition or you may lay each olive on a thin slice of fat pork roll it up tie it dip it in flour and bake in a quick oven until beautifully brown to warm over cold mutton an excellent and simple way is to cut it if loin into chops or leg into thick collops and dip each into egg well beaten with a tablespoonful of milk then in fine bread crumbs and fry in plenty of very hot fat if your crumbs are not very fine and even the larger crumbs will fall off and the appearance will be spoiled these chops will be almost as nice if quickly fried as fresh cooked ones 
they will also be excellent if instead of being breaded they are dipped into thick batter see recipe and fried brown in the same way this method answers for any kind of meat chicken thus warmed over being especially good the batter or egg and bread crumbs form a sort of crust which keeps it tender and juicy any attempt to fry cold meat without either results in a hard stringy unedible dish white meat of any kind is excellent warmed over in a little milk in which you have cut a large onion and if you like it a slice of salt pork or ham and a little sliced cucumber if it is summer thicken with the yolks of one or two eggs added after the whole has simmered twenty minutes take care the egg thickens in the gravy but does not boil or it will curdle if it is in winter chop a teaspoonful of pickled cucumber or capers and add just on going to table in summer when you have the sliced cucumber squeeze half a lemon into the gravy the last thing to give the requisite dash of acid you may vary the above by adding sometimes a few chopped oysters at others mushrooms or celery the last must be put in with the onion and before the meat deviled meat our better halves are usually fond of this especially for breakfast or lunch for this dish take a pair of turkey or chicken drumsticks or some nice thick wedges of underdone beef or mutton score them deeply with a knife and rub them over with a sauce made thus a teaspoonful of vinegar the same of harvey or worcestershire sauce the same of mustard a little cayenne and a tablespoonful of salad oil or butter melted mix all till light cream and take care your meat is thoroughly moistened all over with the mixture then rub your gridiron with butter see that the fire is clear and while the gridiron is getting hot chop a teaspoonful of parsley very fine mix it up with a piece of butter the size of a walnut and lay this in a dish which you will put to get hot then put the meat to be grilled on the fire and turn often so that it will not burn when hot through and brown lay it in the hot dish lay another hot dish over it and serve as quickly as possible with hot plates or the grill may be served with what sawyer calls his mephistophelian sauce which he especially designed for serving with deviled meats chop six shallots or small onions wash and press them in the corner of a clean cloth put them in a stew pan with half a wine glass of chili vinegar pepper sauce a chopped clove a tiny bit of garlic two bay leaves an ounce of glaze boil all together ten minutes then add four tablespoonfuls of tomato sauce a little sugar and ten of broth thickened with roux or water will do if you have no broth it will be remarked that in many french recipes a little sugar is ordered this is not meant to sweeten or even be perceptible but it enriches softens tones as it were the other ingredients as salt does sawyer's frittadella twenty recipes in one put half a pound of bread crumb to soak in a pint of cold water take the same quantity of any kind of roast or boiled meat with a little fat chop it fine press the bread in a clean cloth to extract the water put in a stew pan two ounces of butter a tablespoonful of chopped onions fry two minutes and stir then add the bread stir and fry till rather dry then the meat season with a teaspoonful of salt put in a stew pan two ounces of butter a tablespoonful of chopped onions fry two minutes and stir then add the bread stir and fry till rather dry then the meat season with a teaspoonful of salt half of pepper and a little grated nutmeg and lemon peel stir continually till very hot then add two eggs one at a time mix well and pour on a dish to get cold then take a piece shape it like a small egg flatten it a little egg and bread crumb it all over taking care to keep in good shape do all the same way then put into a frying pan a quarter of a pound of lard or drippings let it get hot and put in the pieces and saute or as we call it fry them a fine yellow brown serve very hot with a border of mashed potatoes or any garniture you fancy sauce piquant or not as you please the above can be made with any kind of meat 
poultry game fish or even vegetables hard eggs or potatoes may be introduced in small quantities and they may be fried instead of sautéed frying in the french in strict sense meaning as i need hardly say entire immersion in very hot fat to fry them you require at least two pounds of fat in your pan oysters or lobsters prepared as above are excellent boileau says un dîner réchauffé ne valut jamais rien but i think a good french cook of the present day would make him alter his opinion indeed savarin quotes a friend of his own a notable gourmand who considered spinach cooked on monday only reached perfection the following saturday having each day of the week been warmed up with butter and each day gaining succulence and a more marrowy consistency the only trouble i find in relation to this part of my present task is the difficulty of knowing when to leave off there are so many ways of warming meats to advantage and in every one there is the suggestion for another that i suffer from an embarras de richesse and have had difficulty in selecting dozens come to mind blanquettes patties curries as i write but as this is not i have said to be a recipe book i forbear of one thing i am quite sure when women once know how to make nice dishes of cold meat they will live well where they now live badly and for less money and hash will be relegated to its proper place as an occasional and acceptable dish End of chapter 11chapter twelve of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter twelve en friandise le rôle du gourmand finit avec l'entremet et celui du friand commence au désert grimaud de la reynière american ladies in cake making and preserving and i feel that on that head i have very little to teach indeed were they as accomplished in all branches of cooking as in making dainty sweet dishes this book would be uncalled for yet notwithstanding their undoubted taste and ability in making friandises it seems to me a few recipes borrowed from what the french call la grande cuisine and possible of execution at home will be welcome to those who wish to vary the eternal ice cream and charlotte russe with other sweets more elegant and likely to be equally popular iced souffle a la byron one pint of sugar syrup of thirty two degrees get this at a druggist's if you do not understand sugar boiling three gills of strained raspberry juice one lemon one gill of maraschino fifteen yolks of eggs two ounces of chocolate drops half a pint of very thick cream whipped method of making this and the next recipe is as follows mix the syrup and yolks of eggs strain into a warm bowl add the raspberry and lemon juice and maraschino whisk till it creams well then take the bowl out of the hot water and whisk ten minutes longer add the chocolate drops and whipped cream lightly fill a case or mould and set in a freezer for two hours then cover the surface with lady fingers or sponge cake dried in the oven a pale brown and rolled serve at once another frozen souffle is as follows one pint of syrup thirty two degrees half a pint of noyau half a pint of cherry juice two ounces of bruised macaroons half a pint of thick cream whipped made in the same way as the last i may here say that the fruit juices can be procured now at all good druggists so that these souffles are very attainable in winter and as noyau and maraschino do not form part of the stores in a family of small means i will give in this chapter recipes for the making of very fair imitations of the genuine liqueurs biscuit glace a la charles dickens one pint of syrup thirty two degrees fifteen yolks of eggs three gills of peach pulp colored pink with cochineal 
one gill of noyau half a pint of thick cream and a little chocolate water ice made with half a pint of syrup and four ounces of the best chocolate smoothly mixed and frozen ready mix syrup yolks peach pulps noyau and a few drops of vanilla whip high mixed with the whipped cream and set in ice for one hour and a half in brick-shaped molds then turn out if very firm and cut in slices an inch thick and coat them all over or on tops and sides with the chocolate ice smoothing with a knife dipped in cold water serve in paper cases biscuit glace a la thackeray one pint of syrup thirty two degrees one pint of strawberry pulp fifteen yolks of eggs one ounce of vanilla sugar flavor a little sugar with vanilla half a pint of thick cream mix syrup yolks strawberry and vanilla sugar whipping as before then add the whipped cream lightly fill paper cases either round or square surround each with a band of stiff paper to reach half an inch above the edge of the case the bands to be pinned together to secure them place them in a freezer when about to send to table remove the bands of paper and cover with macaroons bruised fine and browned in the oven the bands of paper are meant to give the biscuit the appearance of having risen while supposed to bake these delicious ices were invented by francatelli the queen of england's chief cook to do homage to the different great men whose names they bear on the occasion of preparing dinners given in their honour they read as if somewhat intricate but any lady who has ever had ice cream made at home and had the patience to make a charlotte russe need not shrink appalled before these novelties or fear for a successful result baba is a cake many call for at a confectioner's yet few if any one attempts to make it at home that the recipes generally offered do not lead to success may be one reason and i offer the following quite sure if accurately followed such a baba will result as never was eaten outside of paris baba one pound of flour take one quarter of it and make a sponge with half an ounce of compressed yeast and a little warm water set it to rise making a hole in the rest of the flour add to it ten ounces of butter three eggs and a dessert spoonful of sugar a little salt unless your butter salts it enough which is generally the case beat all together well then add five more eggs one at a time that is to say add one egg and beat well then another and beat again and so on until the five are used when the paste leaves the bowl it is beaten enough but not before then add the sponge to it and a large half ounce of citron chopped the same of currants and an ounce and a half of sultana raisins seedless let it rise to twice its size then bake it in an oven of dark yellow paper heat the small round babas are an innovation of the pastry cook to enable him to sell them uncut but the baba proper should be baked in a large deep upright tin such as a large charlotte russe mould when they keep for several days fresh and if they get stale make delicious fritters soaked in sherry and dipped in frying batter in some cases however it may be preferred to make them as usually seen at french pastry cooks for this purpose you require a dozen small-sized round charlotte russe moulds which fill half full only as they rise very much bake these in a hotter oven light brown paper heat dry with a twig as you would any other cake if it comes out dry it is done then prepare a syrup as follows boil half pound of sugar in a pint of water add to this the third of a pint of rum and some apricot pulp peach will of course do and boil all together a few minutes pour this half an inch deep in a dish and stand the cake or cakes in it it should drink up all the syrup you may also sprinkle some over it if any syrup remains use it to warm over your cake when stale instead of the sherry baba was introduced into france by stanislaus lisinski king of poland and the father-in-law of louis the fourteenth and his polish royal descendants still use with it says carême a syrup made of malaga wine and one-sixth part of eau de tanaisi but although our forefathers seem to have relished tansy very much to judge from old recipe books i doubt if such flavoring would be appreciated in our time savarin commonly called wine cake 
by new york pastry cooks are made as follows one pound of flour of which take one quarter to make a sponge using half an ounce of german compressed yeast and a little warm milk when it has risen to twice its bulk add one gill of hot milk two eggs and the rest of the flour mix well then add one more egg and beat another still beating then add three quarters of a pound of fresh butter a quarter of an ounce of salt half an ounce of sugar and half a gill of hot milk beat well then add eggs one at a time beating continually until you have used five more cut in small dice three ounces of candied orange peel butter a tin which should be deep and straight-sided a tin pudding boiler is not a bad thing and sprinkle with chopped almonds fill the mould half full and when risen to twice its bulk bake in a moderate oven dark yellow paper heat when served this cake should stand in a dish of syrup flavored with rum as for baba or with sherry wine boucher des dames a very ornamental and delicious little french cake is sufficiently novel to deserve a place here i think make any nice drop cake batter either sponge or sponge with a little butter in it i prefer drop one on buttered paper and bake if it runs beat in a little more flour and sugar but not much or your cakes will be brittle they should be the size when done of a fifty cent piece and i find half a teaspoonful of batter drop generally makes them about right have a tin cutter or tin box lid if you have no cutter so small about the size and with it trim each cake when baked then take half the number and spread some with a very thin layer of red currant jelly others with peach or raspberry then on each so spread put a cake that is unspread thus making a tiny sandwich or jelly cake if you have different sorts of jelly put each separate as you must adapt the flavor of your icing to the jelly for red currant ice with chocolate icing recipes for icing are so general that i refer you to your cookery book those with peach may have white icing flavored with almond or with rum beating in a little more sugar if the flavoring dilutes your icing too much almond flavoring goes well with raspberry cakes with raspberry jelly or jam should be iced pink coloring the icing with prepared cochineal or cranberry juice thus you have your cakes brown pink and white which look very pretty mixed the process of icing is difficult to do after they are put together but they are much handsomer this way and keep longer you require to accomplish it a good quantity of each kind of icing and a number of little wooden skewers stick one into each cake and dip it in the icing let it run off then stand the other end of the skewer in a box of sand or granulated sugar the easiest way is to ice each half cake before putting in the jelly when the icing is hard spread with jelly and put together curacoa may be successfully imitated by pouring over eight ounces of the thinly pared rind of very ripe oranges a pint of boiling water cover and let it cool then add two quarts of brandy or strong french spirit cover closely and let it stand fourteen days shaking it every day make a clarified syrup of two pounds of sugar into one pint of water well boiled strain the brandy into it leaving it covered close another day rub up in a mortar one drachm of potash with a teaspoonful of the liqueurs when well blended put this into the liqueur and in the same way pound and add a drachm of alum shake well and in an hour or two filter through thin muslin ready for use in a week or two maraschino bruise slightly a dozen cherry kernels put them in a deep jar with the outer rind of three oranges and two lemons cover with two quarts of gin then add syrup and leave it a fortnight as for curacoa stir syrup and spirit together leaving it another day run it through a jelly bag and bottle ready to use in ten days noyau blanch and pound two pounds of bitter almonds or four of peach kernels put to them a gallon of spirit or brandy two pounds of white sugar candy or sugar will do a grated nutmeg and a pot of vanilla leave it three weeks covered close then filter and bottle but do not use it for three months to be used with caution end of chapter twelve
Chapter Thirteen of Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Culture and Cooking, or Art in the Kitchen, by Catherine Owen. Chapter Thirteen: French Candy at Home this chapter i shall have to make one of recipes chiefly for it treats of a branch of cooking not usually found in cookery books or at least there is seldom anything on the art of confectionery beyond molasses or cream taffy and nougat these therefore i shall not touch upon but rather show you how to make the expensive french candies the great art of making these exquisite candies is in boiling the sugar and it is an art easily acquired with patience put into a marbleized saucepan by long experience in sugar boiling i find them less likely to burn even than brass and i keep one for the purpose one pound of sugar and half a pint of water when it has boiled ten minutes begin to try it have a bowl of water with a piece of ice near you and drop it from the end of a spoon when it falls to the bottom and you can take it up and make it into a softish ball not at all sticky between your thumb and finger it is at the right point remove it from the fire to a cold place when cool if perfectly right a thin jelly-like film will be over the surface not a sugary one if it is sugary and you want your candy very creamy you must add a few spoonfuls of water return to the fire and boil again going through the same process of trying it you must be careful that there is not the least inclination to be brittle in the ball of candy you take from the water if so it is boiled a degree too high put a little water to bring it back again and try once more a speck of cream of tartar is useful in checking a tendency in the syrup to go to sugar when you have your sugar boiled just right set it to cool and when you can bear your finger in it begin to beat it with a spoon in ten minutes it will be a white paste resembling lard which you will find you can work like bread dough this then is your foundation called by french confectioners fondant with your fondant you can work marvels but to begin with the simplest french candies take a piece of fondant flavor part of it with vanilla part of it with lemon color yellow see coloring candies and another part with raspberry color pink make these into balls grooved cones or anything that strikes your fancy let them stand till they harden they are then ready for use take another part of your fondant have some english walnuts chopped flavor with vanilla and color pink work the walnuts into the paste as you would fruit into a loaf cake when mixed make a paper case an inch wide and deep and three or four inches long oil it press the paste into it and when firm turn it out and cut into cubes or instead of walnuts use chopped almonds flavor with vanilla and leave the fondant white this makes vanilla almond cream tutti frutti candy chop some almonds citron a few currants and seedless raisins work into some fondant flavor with rum and lemon thus making roman punch or with vanilla or raspberry press into the paper forms as you did the walnut cream you can see how you can ring the changes on these bars varying the flavoring inventing new combinations etc fondant panache take your fondant divide it into three equal parts color one pink and flavor as you choose leave the other white and flavor also as you please but it must agree with the pink and both must agree with the next which is chocolate melt a little unsweetened chocolate by setting it in a saucer over the boiling kettle then take enough of it to make your third piece of fondant a fine brown now divide the white into two parts make each an inch and a half wide and as long as it will do the same with the chocolate fondant then take the pink make it the same width and length but of course not being divided it will be twice as thick now butter slightly the back of a plate or better still get a few sheets of wax paper from the confectioners lay one strip of the chocolate on it then a strip of white on that then the pink the other white and lastly the chocolate again 
then lightly press them to make them adhere but not to squeeze them out of shape you have now an oblong brick of parti colored candy leave it for a few hours to harden then trim it neatly with a knife and cut it crosswise into slices half an inch thick lay on wax paper to dry turning once in a while and pack away in boxes if your fondant gets very hard while you work stand it over hot water a few minutes creamed candies are very fashionable just now and your fondant once ready are very easy to make cream walnuts make ready some almonds some walnuts in halves some hazelnuts or anything of the sort you fancy let them be very dry take fondant made from a pound of sugar set it in a bowl in a saucepan of boiling water stirring it till it is like cream then having flavored it with vanilla or lemon drop in your nuts one by one taking them out with the other hand on the end of a fork resting it on the edge of your bowl to drain for a second then drop the nut onto a waxed or buttered paper neatly if the nut shows through the cream it is too hot take it out of the boiling water and beat till it is just thick enough to mask the nut entirely then return it to the boiling water as it cools very rapidly and becomes unmanageable when it has to be warmed over again very fine chocolate creams are made as follows boil half a pound of sugar with three tablespoonfuls of thick cream till it makes a soft ball in water then let it cool when cool beat it till it is very white flavor with a few drops of vanilla and make it into balls the size of a large pea then take some unsweetened chocolate warmed mix it with a piece of fondant melted there should be more chocolate than sugar and when quite smooth and thick enough to mask the cream drop them in from the end of a fork take them out and drop onto wax paper another very fine candy to be made without heat and therefore convenient for hot weather is made as follows punch drops sift some powdered sugar have ready some fine white gum arabic put a tablespoonful with the sugar say half a pound of sugar and make it into a firm paste if too wet add more sugar flavor with lemon and a tiny speck of tartaric acid or a very little lemon juice make the paste into small balls then take more sugar and make it into icing with a spoonful of santa cruz rum and half the white of an egg try if it hardens if not beat in more sugar and color it a bright pink then dip each ball in the pink icing and harden on wax paper these are very novel beautiful to look at and the flavors may vary to taste to make cochineal coloring which is quite harmless take one ounce of powdered cochineal one ounce of cream of tartar two drachms of alum half a pint of water boil the cochineal water and cream of tartar till reduced to one half then add the alum and put up in small bottles for use yellow is obtained by the infusion of spanish saffron in a little water or a still better one from the grated rind of a ripe orange put into muslin and a little of the juice squeezed through it be careful in boiling the sugar for fondant not to stir it after it dissolved stirring causes it to become rough instead of creamy end of chapter thirteen Chapter 14 of Culture and Cooking or Art in the Kitchen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Culture and Cooking or Art in the Kitchen by Catherine Owen. Chapter 14 A Chapter for People of Very Small Means i am sorry to say in these days this chapter may appeal to many who are yet not to be called poor people who may have been well to do and only suffering from the pressure of the times and for whose cultivated appetites the coarse substantial food of the laboring man even if they could buy it would not be edible who must have what they do have good or starve but as some of the things for which i give recipes will seem over economical for people who can afford to buy meat at least once a day i advise those who have even fifty dollars a month income to skip it reminding them if they do not then necessity knows no law 
a bone of soup meat can be got at a good butcher's for ten or fifteen cents and is about the best investment for that sum i know of as two nourishing and savoury meals at least for four or five persons can be got from it carefully make a nice soup with plenty of vegetables rice or any other thickening you like your bone will weigh from four to six pounds perhaps put it on with water according to size and let it boil down slowly until nice and strong if you have had any scraps of meat or bones put them also to your soup when you serve it keep back a cup of soup and a few of the vegetables and save the meat from which you can make a very appetizing hash in the following way take the meat from the bone chop it with some cold potatoes and the vegetables you save from the soup cold stewed onions boiled carrots or turnips all help to make the dish savory chop an onion very fine unless you have cold ones a little parsley and thyme if liked and sometimes for variety's sake if you have it a pinch of curry powder not enough to make it hot or yellow yet to impart piquancy if you have a tiny bit of fried bacon or cold ham or cold pork chop it with the other ingredients mix all well moisten with the cold soup and when nicely seasoned put the hash into an iron frying pan in which you have a little fat made hot pack it smoothly in cover it with a pot lid and either set it in a hot oven or leave it to brown on the stove if there was more soup than enough to moisten the hash put it on in a tiny saucepan with a little brown flour made into a paste with butter add a drop of tomato ketchup or a little stewed tomato or anything you have for flavoring and stir till it boils then turn the hash out whole on a dish it should be brown and crisp pour the gravy you have made round it and serve for a change make a pie of the hash pour the gravy in through a hole in the top when done it is not generally known that a very nice plain paste can be made with a piece of bread dough to which you have added an egg and some lard dripping or butter the dripping is particularly nice for the hash pie and as you need only a piece of dough as large as an orange you will probably have enough from the soup if you skimmed off all the fat before putting the vegetables in see pot au feu work your drippings into the dough and let it rise well then roll as ordinary pie crust potato crust is also very good for plain pies of any sort but as there are plenty of recipes for it i will not give one here one of the very best hashes i ever ate was prepared by a lady who in better times kept a very fine table and she told me there were a good many cold beans in it well mashed and often since when taking traveller's hash in a hotel i have thought of that savoury dish with regret instead of making your chopped meat into hash vary it by rolling the same mixture into egg-shaped pieces or flat cakes flouring them and frying them nicely in very hot fat pieces of pork or bacon fried and laid round will help out the dish and be an improvement to what is already very good to return once more to the soup bone if any one of your family is fond of marrow seal up each end of the bone with a paste made of flour and water when done take off the paste and remove the marrow made very hot and spread on toast with pepper and salt it will be a relish for someone's tea or breakfast in this country there is a prejudice against sheep's liver while in england where beef liver is looked upon as too coarse to eat and falls to the lot of the cat's meat man or cat butcher sheep's is esteemed next to calf's and it is in fact more delicate than beef liver the nicest way to cook it is in very thin slices not the one inch thick pieces one often sees each slice dipped in flour and fried in pork or bacon fat and pork or bacon served with it but the more economical way is to put it in a pan dredge it with flour pin some fat pork over it and set it in a hot oven when very brown take it out make nice brown gravy by pouring water in the pan and letting it boil on the stove stirring it well to dissolve the glaze pour into the dish and serve the heart should be stuffed with bread crumbs parsley thyme and a little onion and bake separately or for a change you may chop the liver up with a few sweet herbs and a little pork onion or not as you like and some bread crumbs 
put all together in a crock dredge with flour cover and set in a slow oven for an hour and a half then serve with toasted bread around the dish it is very poor economy to buy inferior meat one pound of fine beef has more nourishment than two of poor quality but there is a great difference in prices of different parts of meat and it is better management to choose the cheap part of fine beef than to buy the sirloin of a poor ox even at the same price and by good cooking many parts not usually chosen and therefore sold cheaply can be made very good yet you must remember that a piece of meat at seven cents a pound in which there is at least half fat and bone such as brisket etc is less economical than solid meat at ten or twelve pot roasts are very good for parts of meat not tender enough for roasting the cross rib as some butchers term it being very good for this purpose it is all solid meat and being very lean requires a little fat pork which may be laid at the bottom of the pot or better still holes made in the meat and pieces of the fat drawn through larding in a rough way so that they cut together a pot roast is best put on in an iron pot without water allowed to get finely brown on one side then turned and when thoroughly brown on the other a little water may be added for gravy chop parsley or any seasoning that is preferred give your roast at least three hours to cook ox cheek as the head is called is very good and should be very cheap prepare it thus clean the cheek soak it in water six hours and cut the meat from the bones which break up for soup then take the meat cut into neat pieces put it in an earthen crock a layer of beef some thin pieces of pork or bacon some onions carrots and turnips cut thin or chopped fine and sprinkled over the meat also some chopped parsley a little thyme and bay leaf pepper and salt and a clove to each layer then more beef and a little pork vegetables and seasoning as before when all your meat is in pour over it if you have it a tumbler of hard cider and one of water or else two of water in which put a half gill of vinegar if you have no tight-fitting cover to your crock put a paste of flour and water over it to keep the steam in place the crock in a slow oven five or six hours and when it is taken out remove the crust and skim any piece of beef cooked in this way is excellent ox heart is one of the cheapest of dishes and really remarkably nice and it is much used by economical people abroad the heart should be soaked in vinegar and water three or four hours then cut off the lobes and gristle and stuff it with fat pork chopped bread crumbs parsley thyme pepper and salt then tie it in a cloth and very slowly simmer it large end up for two hours take it up remove the cloth and flour it and roast it a nice brown lay in the pan in which it is to be roasted some fat pork to baste it any of this left over is excellent hashed or warmed in slices with a rich brown gravy cannot be told from game another way is to stuff it with sage and onions it must always be served very hot with hot plates and on a very hot dish four quarter of mutton is another very economical part of meat if you get your butcher to cut it so that it may not only be economical but really afford a choice joint do not let him hack the shoulder across but before he does a thing to it get him to take the shoulder out in a round plate shaped joint with knuckle attached if he does this well that is cuts it close to the bone of the ribs you will have a nice joint then do not have it chopped at all this should be roasted in the oven very nicely and served with onion sauce or stewed onions if onions are not liked mashed turnips are the appropriate vegetable this joint to be enjoyed must be properly carved and that is across the middle from the edge to the bone the same as a leg of mutton and like the leg you must learn as i cannot describe it in words where the bone lies then have that side nearest you and cut from the opposite side you have besides this joint another roast from the ribs or else cut it up into chops till you come to the part under the shoulder from this the breast should be separated and both either made into a good irish stew or the breast prepared alone in a way i shall describe the neck and thin ribs being stewed or boiled 
the neck of mutton is very tender boiled and served with parsley or caper sauce the liquor it is boiled in served as broth with vegetables and rice or prepared as directed in a former chapter for the broth from leg of mutton the mode i am about to give of preparing breast of mutton was told me by a welsh lady of rank at whose table i ate it it appeared as a side dish and who said half laughingly will you take some fuff we are very fond of it but breast of mutton is such a despised dish i never expect any one else to like it i took it on my principle of trying everything and did find it very good this lady told me that having of course a good deal of mutton killed on her father's estate and the breast always being despised by the servants she had invented a way of using it to avoid waste her way was this set the breast of mutton on the fire whole just covered with water in which is a little salt when it comes to the boil draw it back and let it simmer three hours then take it up and draw out the bones and lay a force meat of bread crumbs parsley thyme chopped suet salt and pepper all over it double or roll it skewer it and coat it thickly with egg and bread crumbs then bake it in a moderate oven basting it often with nice dripping or butter when nicely brown it is done and eats like the tenderest lamb it was when i saw it served on a bed of spinach i like it better on a bed of stewed onions i now give some dishes made without meat ragout of cucumber and onions fry equal quantities of large cucumbers and onions in slices until they are a nice brown the cucumber will brown more easily if cut up and put to drain some time before using then flour each slice when both are brown pour on them a cup of water and let them stew for half an hour then take a good piece of butter in which you have worked a dessert spoonful of flour browned add pepper salt and a little tomato ketchup or stewed tomato this is a rich eating dish if nicely made and will help out cold meat or a scant quantity of it very well a little cold meat may be added if you have it onion soup fry six large onions cut into slices with a quarter of a pound of butter till they are of a bright brown then well mix in a tablespoonful of flour and pour on them rather more than a quart of water stew gently until the onions are quite tender season with a spoonful of salt and a little sugar stir in quickly a liaison made with the yolks of two eggs mixed with a gill of milk or cream do not let it boil afterwards put some toast in a tureen and serve very hot pea soup steep some yellow split peas all night next morning set them on to boil with two quarts of water to a pint of peas in the water put a tiny bit of soda in another pot put a large carrot a turnip an onion and a large head of celery all cut small and covered with water when both peas and vegetables are tender put them together season with salt pepper and a little sugar and let them gently stew till thick enough then strain through a colander rubbing the vegetables well and return to the pot while you fry some sippets of bread a crisp brown then stir into the soup two ounces of butter in which you have rolled a little flour this soup is simply delicious and the fact of it being maigre will not be remembered potato soup is another of this good kind for meat is scarcely required so good is it without boil some potatoes then rub them through a colander into two quarts of hot milk skimmed does quite well have some finely chopped parsley and onion add both with salt and pepper stew three quarters of an hour then stir in a large piece of butter and beat two eggs with a little cold milk stir in quickly and serve with fried bread there should be potatoes enough to make the soup as thick as cream do not be prejudiced against a dish because there is no meat in it and you think it cannot be nourishing this chapter is not written for those with whom meat or money is plentiful and if it be true that man is nourished not by what he eats but by what he assimilates and according to an american medical authority what is eaten with distaste is not assimilated dr hall it follows that an enjoyable dinner even without meat will be more nourishing than one forced down because it lacks savor that potato soup will be more nourishing than potatoes and butter with a cup of milk to drink because more enjoyable yet it costs no more for the soup can be made without the eggs if they are scarce 
or say bread and butter and onions they will not be very appetizing especially if they had to be a frequent meal yet onion soup is made from the same materials and in france is a very favorite dish even with those well able to put meat in it if they wished end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter fifteen a few things it is well to remember every housekeeper has pet wrinkles of her own which she thinks are especially valuable some are known to all the world others are new to many so it may be with mine but on the chance that some few things are as new to my friends as they were to me i jot them down without any pretense of order or regularity lemons will keep fresher and better in water than any other way put them in a crock cover them with water they will in winter keep two or three months and the peel be as fresh as the day they were put in take care of course that they do not get frosted in summer change the water twice a week they will keep a long time in grating nutmegs begin at the flour end if you commence at the other there will be a hole all the way through tea or coffee made hot not at all scorched before water is added are more fragrant and stronger thus by putting three spoonfuls of tea in the pot and setting in a warm place before infusing it will be as strong as if you make tea with four spoonfuls without warming it and much more fragrant vegetables that are strong can be made much milder by tying a bit of bread in a clean rag and boiling it with them bread dough is just as good made the day before it is used thus a small family can have fresh bread one day rolls the next by putting the dough in a cold place enveloped in a damp cloth in winter kept cold yet not in danger of freezing it will keep a week celery seed takes the place of celery for soup or stews when it is scarce parsley seed of parsley green beans gherkins etc put down when plentiful in layers of rock salt will keep crisp and green for months and can be taken out and pickled when convenient lemon or orange peel grated and mixed with powdered sugar and a squeeze of its own juice the sugar making it into paste is excellent to keep for flavoring put it into a little pot and it will keep for a year bread that is very stale may be made quite fresh for an hour or two by dipping it quickly into milk or water and putting it in a brisk oven till quite hot through it must be eaten at once or it will be as stale as ever when cold meat to be kept in warm weather should be rubbed over with salad oil every crevice filled with ginger meat that is for roasting or frying is much better preserved in this way than with salt take care that every part of the surface has a coat of oil steaks or chops cut off which always keep badly should be dipped into warm butter or even dripping if oil is not handy the object being to exclude the air and then hung up till wanted mutton in cold weather should be hung four or five weeks in a place not subject to changes of temperature and before it is so hung every crevice filled with ginger and thoroughly dredged with flour which must be then rubbed in with the hand till the surface is quite dry this is the english fashion of keeping venison it may be useful for those who burn kerosene to know that when their lamps smell give a bad light and smoke it is not necessary to buy new burners put the old ones in an old saucepan with water and a tablespoonful of soda let them boil half an hour wipe them and your trouble will be over meat that has become slightly tainted may be quite restored by washing it in water in which is a teaspoonful of borax cutting away every part in the least discolored in summer when meat comes from the butchers if it is not going to be used the same day it should be washed over with vinegar poultry in summer should always have a piece of charcoal tied in a rag placed in the stomach to be removed before cooking pieces of charcoal should also be put in the refrigerator and changed often 
oyster shells put one at a time in a stove that is clinkered will clean the bricks entirely they should be put in when the fire is burning brightly salt and soapstone powder to be bought at the druggists mend fire brick use equal quantities make into a paste with water and cement the brick they will be as strong as new ones ink spilled on carpets may be entirely removed by rubbing while wet with blotting paper using fresh as it soils end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter sixteen on some table prejudices many people have strong prejudices against certain things which they have never even tasted or which they do frequently take and like as a part of something else without knowing it how common it is to hear and see untravelled people declare that they dislike garlic and could not touch anything with it in yet those very people will take worcestershire sauce in which garlic is actually predominant with everything they eat and think none but english pickles eatable which owe much of their excellence to the introduction of a soupçon of garlic therefore i beg those who actually only know garlic from hearsay abuse of it or from its presence on the breath of some inveterate garlic eater to give it a fair trial when it appears in a recipe it is just one of those things that require the most delicate handling for which the french term a suspicion is most appreciated it should only be a suspicion its presence should never be pronounced as blot once begged his readers give garlic a fair trial in a remoulade sauce montpellier butter beaten into mayonnaise is a good remoulade for cold meat or fish curry is one of those things against which many are strongly prejudiced and i am inclined to think it is quite an acquired taste but a taste which is an enviable one to its possessors for them there is endless variety in all they eat the capabilities of curry are very little known in this country and as the taste for it is so limited i will not do more in its defence than indicate a pleasant use to which it may be put and in which form it would be a welcome condiment to many to whom a curry pure and simple would be obnoxious i once knew an anglo-indian who used curry as most people use cayenne it was put in a pepper box and with it he would at times pepper his fish or kidneys even his eggs used in this way it imparts a delightful piquancy to food and is neither hot nor spicy few people are so prejudiced as the english generally and the stay-at-home americans but the latter are to be taught by travel the englishman rarely the average briton leaves his island shores with the conviction that he will get nothing fit to eat till he gets back and that he will have to be uncommonly careful once across the channel or he will be having fricasseed frogs palmed on him for chicken poor man in his horror of frogs he does not know that the paris restaurateur who should give the costly frog for chicken would soon end in the bankruptcy court if i could only get a decent dinner a good roast and a plain potato i would like paris much better said an old englishman to me once in that gay city but surely you can no i have been to restaurants of every class and called for beefsteak and roast beef but have never got the real article although it's my belief said he leaning forward solemnly that i have eaten horse three times this week of course the english man of rank who has spent half his life on the continent is not at all the average englishman americans think the hare and rabbits of which the english make such good use very mean food indeed and if they are unprejudiced enough to try them from the fact that they are never well cooked they dislike them which prejudice the english reciprocate by looking on squirrels as being little fit for food as a rat and a familiar instance of prejudice 
from ignorance carried even to insanity is that of the irish in eighteen forty eight starving rather than eat the yaller mail sent them by generous american sympathizers yet they come here and soon get over that dislike not so the french who look on oatmeal and indian meal as most unwholesome food sa pèse sur l'estomac sa cruse l'estomac i heard an old frenchwoman say trying to dissuade a mother from giving her children mush the moral of all which is that for our comfort's sake and the general good we should avoid unreasonable prejudices against unfamiliar food we of course have a right to our honest dislikes but to condemn things because we have heard them despised is prejudice End of chapter 16chapter seventeen of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen chapter seventeen a chapter of odds and ends valedictory i have alluded in an earlier chapter to the fact that many inexperienced cooks are afraid of altering recipes a few words on this subject may not be out of place as a rule a recipe should be faithfully followed in all important parts for instance in making soup you cannot because you are short of the given quantity of meat put the same amount of water as directed for the full quantity without damaging your soup but you may easily reduce water and every other ingredient in the same proportion and in mere matters of flavoring you may vary to suit circumstances if you are told to use cloves and have none a bit of mace may be substituted if you read a recipe and it calls for something you have not consider whether that something has anything to do with the substance of the dish or whether it is merely an accessory for which something else can be substituted for instance if you are ordered to use cream in a sauce milk with a larger amount of well-washed butter may take its place but if you are told to use cream for charlotte russe or trifles there is no way in which you could make milk serve since it is not an accessory but the chief part of these dishes for a cake in which cream is used butter whipped to a cream may take its place wine is usually optional in savory dishes it gives richness only again in cakes be very careful the exact proportions of flour eggs and milk are observed of butter you can generally use more or less having a more or less rich cake in proportion in any but plain cupcakes which greatly depend on soda and acid for their lightness never lessen the allowance of eggs never add milk if a cake is too stiff but an extra egg may always be used unless milk is ordered in the recipe when more or less may be used as needed flavoring may be always varied in reducing a recipe always reduce every ingredient and it can make no difference in the results sometimes in cookery books you are told to use articles not frequently found in ordinary kitchens for instance a larding needle although that can be bought for twenty-five cents at any house furnishing store and should always be in a kitchen but in case you have not one for meat you may manage by making small cuts and inserting slips of bacon another article that is very useful but seldom if ever to be found in small kitchens is a salamander but when you wish to brown the top of a dish and putting it in the oven would not do or the oven is not quick enough to serve an iron shovel made nearly red and a few red cinders in it is a very good salamander it must be held over the article that requires browning near enough to color it yet not to burn in the recipes i have given nothing is required that cannot be obtained with more or less ease in new york for syrups fruit juices etc apply to your druggist if he has not them he will tell you where to obtain them we often make up our minds that because a thing is not commonly used in this country it is impossible to get it 
really there are very few things not to be got in new york city to the intelligent seeker you need an article of french or italian or maybe english grocery that your grocer a first-class one perhaps has not and you make up your mind you cannot get it but go into the quarters where french people live and you can get everything belonging to the french cuisine so prejudiced are the french in favor of the production of la belle france that they do not believe in our parsley or our chives or garlic or shallots for i know at least one french grocer who imports them for his customers on being asked why he brought them from france to a country where those very things were plentiful he answered oh french herbs are much finer needless to say tarragon is one of the herbs so imported and can thus be bought but as several new jersey truck gardeners grow all kinds of french herbs they can be got in washington market and most druggists keep them dried but for salads montpellier butter and some other uses the dried herb would not do although for flavoring it would serve but the far better way is to grow them for yourself as i have done any large seedsman will supply you with burnet tarragon and borage very useful for salads punch etc seeds and if you live in the country have an herb bed if in town there are few houses where there is not ground enough to serve for the purpose but even in these few houses one can have a box of earth in the kitchen window in which your seeds will flourish parsley is a thing in almost daily request in winter yet it is very expensive to buy it constantly for the sake of using the small spray that often suffices it is a good plan therefore in fall to get a few roots plant them in a pot or box and they will flourish all winter if kept where they will not freeze and be ready for garnishing at any minute always as far as your means allow have every convenience for cooking by having utensils proper for every purpose you save a great deal of work and much vexation of spirit yet it should be no excuse for bad work that such utensils are not at hand a willing and intelligent cook will make the best of what she has apropos of this very thing Gouffet relates that a friend of his an artist of renown was sent for to the chateau of a baron argentoy who had taken a large company with him unexpectedly crowding the chateau in every part he was shown into a dark passage in which a plank was suspended from the ceiling and told this was to be his kitchen he had to fashion his own utensils for there was nothing provided and his pastry he had to bake in a frying pan besides building two monumental plots on that board and prepare a cold entree but he cheerfully set to work to overcome difficulties achieved his task and was rewarded by the plaudits of the diners such difficulties as these our servants never have to encounter and a cheerful endeavor to make the best of everything should be the rule yet let us spare them all the labor we can or rather make it as easy and pleasant as possible they will be more proud of their well-furnished kitchen more cheerful in it than they will of one where everything for their convenience is grudged and such pride and cheerfulness will be your gain there is always a great deal of talk about servants in america how bad and inefficient they are how badly they contrast with those of england certainly they are not so efficient as those of the older country how could they be there girls who are intended for servants have ever held before their eyes what they may or may not do in the future calling and how it is to be done but take one of these orderly efficient girls put her in an american family as general servant or as cook where two are kept washing and ironing to do and a variety of other work and see how your english servant would stare at your requirements she has been accustomed to her own line of work at home if housemaid she has been dressed for the day at noon if cook she has never done even her own washing she may and will no doubt fall into the way of the country after a while and on account of her early habits of respect will make a good servant perhaps but many of them would be quite indignant at being asked to do the average servant's work here i am speaking now of the trained servants but comparing the london maid of all work or slavey with our own general servants 
and considering how much more is expected of the latter the comparison seems to me vastly in the favor of our own bridgets we may rest assured however smoothly the wheels of household management glide along in wealthy families across the water people who can only keep one or two have all our troubles with servants and a few added and their faults are just as general a subject of conversation among ladies france out of paris from parisian servants deliver me and germany seem the favored lands where one servant does the work of three or four yet even they are they say degenerating let us then be contented and make the best of what we have assured that even biddy is not so hopeless as she is painted kindness not weakness firmness and patience work wonders even with the roughest emerald that ever crossed the sea i have said somewhere else that you must beware of attempting too much at once perfect yourself in one thing before you attempt another take breaded chops or fried oysters make opportunities for having them rather often and do not rest satisfied until you have them as well fried as you have ever seen them anywhere practice makes perfect and you certainly will achieve perfection if you are not discouraged by one failure but above all things never make experiments for company let them be made when it really matters little whether you succeed or not and let your experiments be on a small scale don't attempt to fry a large dish of oysters or chops until it is a very easy task or make more than half a pound of puff paste at first for if you fail with a large task before you you will be tired and disheartened hate the sight of what you are doing and as a consequence not be likely to return to it very soon the same may be said of cooks some of them are very fond of experiments which taste i should always encourage but do not let them jump from one experiment to the other if they try a dish and fail they often make up their minds that the fault is not theirs that it is not worth while to bother with it here your knowledge will be of service you will show them that it can be done how it should be done and order the dish cook failed in frequently giving it sufficient surveillance to prevent your family suffering from her inexperience for as a witty frenchman said of mademoiselle du defoe's cook between her and branvilliers there is only the difference of intention few things add more to a man or woman's social reputation than the fact that they keep a good table it need not be one where the strong table groans beneath the smoking sirloin stretched immense but a table where whatever you do have will be good be it pork and beans or salmi the pork and beans would satisfy a bostonian the salmi grimaud de la reniere himself i do not admit with d walcott that the turnpike road to people's hearts i find lies through their mouths or i mistake mankind but it is a fact that good living by this i do not mean extravagant living presupposes good breeding well-bred people sometimes live badly but ill-bred people seldom or ever live well in the right sense of the term now by way of valedictory let me repeat that i do not think a lady's best or proper place is the kitchen but it is quite possible to have a perfectly served table yet spend very little time there only that one little hour a day that talleyrand the busy man full of intrigue and statecraft found time to spend with his cook would ensure your table being well served for after devoting say a few winter months to perfecting yourself in a few things you will be able to teach your cook who is often ambitious to excel if put in the right way a word here about cooks the knowledge that if they fail to do a thing well you will do it yourself will often put them on their mettle to do their best while the feeling that you don't know will make them careless servants have a great deal more amour propre than people imagine therefore stimulate it by judicious praise and appreciation let them think that to send in a dish perfect is a glory to themselves as well as a pleasure to you while careful to remark when alone with them upon any fault that results from carelessness be equally careful to give all the praise you can and repeat to them complimentary remarks 
that may have been made on their skill servants are usually such is the weakness of feminine nature whether in the drawing-room or the kitchen very sensitive to the praise or blame of the gentlemen of the family indulge poor humanity a little when you honestly can end of chapter seventeen end of culture and cooking or art in the kitchen by katherine owen